Go ahead. Uh, first, I would like to say that even though I have to direct my statement to the court, I understand that it's not for the court, it's for Sidney Lou's family. And I also want you to know that my attorneys could only defend me on what I told them. And I think they did a great job at that, but uh, they could only work with what I told them, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And I guess last request is, I don't want to do this like a coward. Is there any way that I can come to that side of the table and face the Lou family when I uh, read this statement to them? No, sir, you need to stay where you are. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> I am writing this down so that I don't leave anything out, as this will be the only time I get to address Sidney Luce's family. I realize that nothing I can say here today will change in the least what I did to Sidney three and a half years ago. I won't say I'm sorry, as that would be an insult to you after what I've put you through, and I won't ask for forgiveness, as I, as I don't believe there is such a thing. I doubt that there is such a thing as closure in a case such as this, so I won't pretend that I am doing that. I am only doing what I should have done three and a half years ago. A lot of very bad things have been said about me, and I don't disagree. I have never claimed to be a good person, but I do, however, live by a set of rules. During my interviews with law enforcement and here in this courtroom, a lot of lies were told about Sidney Loof. I was fighting a death penalty case, so telling the truth was the farthest thing from my mind. If you know where to look on the internet, you will find that a lot of people believe those lies, and I would now like to clear them up, those up. Sidney Loof did not die as a result of erotic asphyxiation. I murdered her. Sidney was never a part of our group. She was never paid to participate in any sexual or criminal activities, nor did she ever make phone calls for me in any of my scams. Sidney was never at the Grand Weaver Motel with me. The two motel clerks that testified that they saw her there were with me on more than one occasion were mistaken. I took a lot of women to that motel, and obviously they mistook one of them for Sydney. The landlord's wife from the apartment here in Wilbur who testified that she saw Sydney at the apartment with me earlier in the summer of 2017 was mistaken. Sydney was never at the apartment prior to the one time in November of 2017. A lot of women were in and out of there. A lot of them were blondes. I'm sure she mistook one of them for Sydney. When I told law enforcement where Sydney Luce's phone was, and told them that what was, what was on her phone would help me more than it did them, it was a calculated risk. I had no idea what was on her phone. I took a guess that there would be something on the phone that could be used in a negative light. There were a couple of pictures and comments on there that I exploited to the fullest. They had absolutely nothing to do with her being involved in a secret lifestyle. Katie Brandle, who was with us for a week after Sydney's death, had nothing to do with it, and she was not with us when the when we disposed of Sydney's body in Clay County. Until now, I have never told the truth about how and why Sydney died. Almost everything I said was a lie unless it benefited me. The state got a lot of it right, but not some of the biggest things. I did use Bailey to lure Sydney to the apartment as I had done with all the girls. You heard three of them testify at my trial. The plan, however, was not to get her there to kill her, but to pull her into our little group. I used women for sex and, and in my criminal activities. Killing her intentionally would have been very counterproductive. I do not deny, however, that I premeditated Sydney's murder. The only difference is it was two or three hours after she got to the apartment that I decided to kill her, and not days in advance. But premeditation, as I understand, is premeditation, and that makes very little difference. I seriously misjudged Sydney from her and Bailey's messages and what happened on their first date. Once I sat Sydney down and started explaining how we made money, some of our criminal activities, and about the group sex and other things, I knew I had made a bad mistake as Sydney somewhat freaked out. I tried for about 30 minutes to calm her down and had Bailey talk to her, but it did no good. I finally restrained her by tying her hands in front of her. I took her in the bedroom and told her to lay down and relax and warned her what would happen if she didn't. The truth is I killed Sydney because of her reaction to what I had told her and shown her. I had no doubt that she would tell people if I let her go. At the time, Bailey and I both had warrants and were living the good life from our criminal activities, and I was willing to do anything to protect that. I, strang I strangled Sydney with an extension cord in the bedroom of the apartment here in Wilbur. I have always told the truth when I said Bailey was not in the bedroom when I killed Sydney. Bailey was in the li living room when I killed Sydney. All I told Bailey when I went into the bedroom was to stay there. I was going to talk to Sydney. I've always told the truth that the reason I dismembered her body 
was that I could find no other way to get her out of the apartment without being seen carrying her. Bailey helped me carry Sydney's body from the bedroom into the dining room. I had planned to have her help me in the dismember, but, but she started dry heaving, just carrying Sydney's body, so I did it myself. I am the one who made the outline around Sydney's tattoo. There was no message or satanic anything meant by that. I had planned to remove her tattoos to make it harder to identify her body, but didn't. That is why the tattoo was outlined. Bailey and I cleaned up the apartment and she drove me to Clay County where I disposed of Sydney's body in an overgrown ditch line. I've done some terrible things in my life, but this is the only thing I have ever done that I feel real regret about. In the past, I could justify myself, but not this time. Sydney did nothing but reject my lifestyle and threatened to expose it, and I killed her for it. I am fully aware that nothing I have said will change a single thing here today, but it is the truth. I am not looking for mercy, forgiveness, or anything else. To be quite frank, and with no disrespect intended to the court, I could care less what you do to me here today. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Seven, sentence A, imposed by the panel on count one, murder in the first degree, a class one felony, the defendant is sentenced to death. B, imposed by the presiding judge on count two, improper disposal of human skeletal remains, a class four felony, the defendant is sentenced to two years in the Nebraska Department of Corrections. Such, such sentence will run consecutive to count one. On count two, pursuant to Nebraska statute, the court finds following substantial and compelling reasons why the defendant cannot effectively and safely be supervised in the community on probation. A lesser sentence would depreciate the seriousness of the crime and promote disrespect for the law. Incarceration is necessary to protect the security of the public. The risk is substantial that during a period of probation, the defendant will engage in additional criminal conduct, and the defendant is in need of correctional treatment that can be provided most effectively by commitment to a correctional facility. C imposed by the sentencing judge on count three, criminal conspiracy. To commit first degree murder, the defendant is sentenced to 50 years in the Nebraska Department of Corrections, consecutive to counts one and two. 